now return to our evening call-ins. The topic shifts to the future of the NASA space station. On June 7th, NASA is to report to an independent oversight panel with design options for the station. Three days later, the panel will report to the White House. Up next, our guests will be Lori Garver, Executive Director of the National Space Society, and John Pike, Director of the Space Policy Project for the Federation of American Scientists. Garber is executive director of the National Space Society. What's the status of a U.S. space station? The space station program right now has been redesigned by directive of the president. We have three options that are under consideration and they'll be going to the president next week for his choice as to which space station will then go to the Congress uh, to be funded. What are the options? We have three options, A, B, and C. A is a scaled-down version of Space Station Freedom. B is also a scaled-down version of Space Station Freedom, but somewhat more robust than A. And C is a CAN, a single-launch space station that would be, um, have more space than Space Station Freedom did, but would be much less technologically advanced. John Pike is director of the Space Policy Project of the, at the Federation of American Scientists. Where do you see the status of the space station right now? Well, I think the fundamental um, problem with the space station right now is generic to the American space program and those of other countries, namely that the Cold War is over, that the space station, like many of our other space projects, was predicated on the Cold War, and with the deficit and the economy in the shape that they're in right now, I think that Bill Clinton has decided that uh, the old space station design cost too much and didn't do enough. The real problem, however, is that all of the design options that NASA has come up with uh, costing between 14 and 18 billion dollars are much more expensive than the five to nine billion dollars that President Clinton said he's prepared to spend. The money that's been spent so far, what's it been spent on? Well, they spent eight billion dollars on space station freedom thus far, and it's basically to bring the design of the station up to the point that you can actually start building the thing. And so under the old plan, they were going to have what they call the critical design review this spring, which they have completed, after which they would actually start cutting metal and getting ready to fly it. Lori Garber, is it worth the money? Certainly. The space station program is the pinnacle project for our space program. If humans are going to go out in space, we've got to learn how to do it. We've had a space station under review since the early 1970s following on Apollo. It was the next logical step. NASA has portrayed it as that, and I think they're right. Can I get you both to, to talk about what uh, the, the human role is in space? Uh, for our viewers outside of Washington, the uh, Post Sunday Magazine had a front page story, just of it was, is NASA necessary? What do you see as the need for us to be in space? Well, I think humans have an intrinsic need to explore and to settle. And beyond our Earth's boundaries, space is that next frontier. Certainly, there are new discoveries to be made when we explore, and I think new knowledge is something that humans must have a drive for. They have been driving since we went out to the sea, and when we first stepped on the moon, we did that for all of humanity. And there's no way that we're going to stop exploring. Well, I think there are basically two types of contributions, the sort of cultural and political contributions that Laurie has been talking about, as well as uh, more practical contributions like developing new pharmaceuticals or developing new electronics materials. The problem, though, is that while I can't put a price tag on the cultural and national aspiration aspects of the space program, I can put a price tag on the value of the scientific and commercial research that would be done on one of these space stations, and it's very clear that the value of that research would be trivial compared to the cost of the station, and that's the real question facing President Clinton today, whether he's going to come up with a space station that will continue to serve as a national symbol, or whether he's going to come up with a space station that is simply going to be for grotesquely overpriced scientific research. 
Good evening, and welcome to our continuing discussion this evening, our live call-in segment. Uh, we invite you to join us as we focus on the U.S. Space Station and its future. We're going to look back at where it's come so far, where it stands right now, what options the President might be considering, and we invite you to join us with your questions and comments about the Space Station. You'll see the phone numbers at the bottom of the screen, and as always, we ask if you've called in the past 30 days to wait so that others are uh, able to get in more easily with their questions and comments. We're going to the phones right away. Our guests this evening are Lori Garber, who's Executive Director of the National Space Society. Tell us about the Society. The Space Society is a nonprofit educational organization that promotes the space program. We have about 25,000 members, and these are individuals not necessarily employed in the space industry. They're people who care about the space program and think it's an important investment. How uh, does it cost to join? $35. And John Pike is director of the Space Policy Project at the Federation of American Scientists. So tell us about the Federation and the project. Well, the Federation was founded in 1945 by scientists who had worked on the Manhattan Project. And since then, we've done research in public education on science and public policy. The Space Policy Project was founded at FAS 10 years ago, and we concentrate on military and civil space policy. First call is from Fairview Heights, Illinois. Good evening. Uh, hi. Um, I was just going to ask John Pike how he could justify $8 billion in the development only of the space station. Uh, that just shows that there's another organization out there that's milking the government to get as much as they can to do what they can. You know, it's eight well, I'll tell you what, we'll ask both our guests. To, again, we briefly mentioned early on about that $8 billion figure. Well, I think that the question of the $8 billion... Um, there are several different perspectives that you can bring to that. If you look, say, at uh, the annual budget of the National Institutes of Health, the federally funded medical research agency, $8 billion would pay for all of the federally funded medical research that America does in one year. On the other hand, when I look at the overall cost of the station program, probably $120 billion over the next 30 years to have spent $8 billion developing it doesn't seem like a very high price to pay. I think the fundamental judgment that the Congress and the nation is going to have to make is whether expenditures of these very large sums of money that are not going to produce tangible returns, even though they produce very large intangible returns, is something that we're prepared to pay for. Lori Garber. Yeah, I think the $8 billion um, is a lot of money, and that's why we are discussing this in such a public format. Um, Congress really needs to decide if this is a priority. Keep in mind that $8 billion was spent over a 10-year period when President Reagan announced this program. It was in 1984. I also think the $8 billion is one of the reasons President Clinton has decided to redesign the space station. He feels that it can be done for less, and we can perhaps meet our national objectives without without having the Cadillac of space stations. La Jolla, California. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I was just listening to this conversation and it seems to me that with the unemployment we have in the country, over 7 percent, we got 36 million people without hospitalization. And I think this boondoggle of the space station and the super colliding superconductor are nothing but pork, and I think they ought to just take this money and put it into our economy, put it into jobs, put it into health care. Okay, thanks, California. Lori Garber, you mentioned earlier about the industry. How many, how many people are working in jobs that, that go into building, <coughs> or, or that would go into building a space station? There are 20,000 people employed by this program, so certainly the caller is referring to pork. That is what pork is, our jobs. And so it's a little difficult to distinguish between the two. I think this program is something meaningful for the country, but as Senator Jake Garn, was, who flew in space, uh, was fond of saying, he didn't take any money when he went into space. There's nothing you can buy there. All this money is spent here on Earth in programs in, for jobs and I think there are also discoveries that can be made in regard to health, since the caller mentioned um, health care. The space program is a relatively small investment for the great benefits you're going to get, including benefits to the U.S. economy. John Pike, should jobs in the aerospace industry be a consideration? Well, I think that there's certainly a consideration when we're looking at the reduction in our military budget and looking at ways of maintaining our defense industrial base. I guess that I'm bothered, though, 
that we're basically having an argument over a few hundred million dollars a year over the space station when Bill Clinton has decided to spend four billion dollars a year on the Star Wars program. If I had to choose among these various space programs, it seems to me that we could have a substantial reduction in that Star Wars request, fund the space program, uh, the space station program, and still have plenty of money left over for useful things as well. Watertown, New York. Good evening. Yes. How are you? Good. Uh, this is my first time calling, and my the, uh, space happens to be one of my favorite things anyway. And the thing I question I want to ask is, uh, do we feel that we're robbing our our future youth of their future in space when we talk about space exploration and this sort of thing uh, as as being as expensive as it is and everything? I mean, we went to the moon, and you know, we sell science to our children through like Star Trek and Star, Star Wars and this sort of thing. But when it comes right down to the real reality, we don't seem to want to uh, re-gear our industries toward building and going into space. Don't you think there are jobs to be made from doing this sort of thing? Lori Garber? Certainly, I think one of the reasons we argue for an investment in our future is because of our children. I have a one-year-old, and I certainly hope that he has a future not only in space, but through the many benefits that we have from the space program. Certainly, there are other programs which inspire children as well, but I think the space program has proven throughout, especially the Apollo years, that our investment really inspired young people to get involved in science and engineering, and that's one of the very strong rationales for our space program. Well, during the 1960s, I think that uh, when I was growing up in the 60s, watching uh, Star Trek on TV uh, was uh, very inspiring to me because it said to me that despite the turbulence of the 60s, both in America and around the world, that there was a future and that it was a hopeful future uh, that suggested that we were going to be able to get through those problems. I think the real question today facing Bill Clinton is whether he's going to decide to build a space station that's going to enable us to continue the human exploration of space or whether he's going to settle on a station that's going to be sold on short-term benefits but ultimately is not going to get us out there with Starship Enterprise. And I'm afraid at this point uh, it's that future that he's turning away from. This is from USA Today. Uh, Lori Garber, you mentioned initially the three options. They, the three are shown here. Can you explain for us uh, what these are? I mean, they, they are labeled A, B, and C with the different price tags, uh, five, nine, and seven billion dollars. Yeah, I think that option A you have there is the five billion dollar option. I'm not sure that they could bring that in for five billion dollars. I think sure that would that be a miracle. I'm sure, I'm sure that they <laughs> couldn't. And, 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 this, and, and what's significant about this particular option? It is space station derived to the extent that they try and keep the major components of space station. It is really A for austere. It is a program that is greatly scaled back. As you can see there, they have it listed as the lowest program. Okay, then option B is nine billion. Option B is the compromise really that I think we've seen mentioned by leaders in Congress like Congressman George Brown from California. It is also a freedom derived space station and it is the most robust and expensive of all three options. And C. C was the can I mentioned. C um, has a one element launch which means it could go up faster than the others and it has more volume. However, it is not as technologically as advanced and does not um, utilize the existing contracts and hardware of freedom. And John Pike, while this is still up, uh, your observations on the, the three options? Well, my first observation is that uh, the five, nine, and seven billion dollars are what Bill Clinton asked for. Unfortunately, NASA's estimates range from about thirteen billion dollars, the cheapest for option C, up to about eighteen billion dollars for option B. So all of the NASA options currently under consideration are about twice as expensive as Clinton said he was prepared to pay for. Deal Maryland, good evening. Uh, hello, um, I wanted to ask Lori and John for that matter, um, why as far as the scientific research goes, why can't we use the space station that's already in orbit, the um, the Mir, the Mir space station put up by the former Soviet Union. Well, frankly, I think that this is really the only live option that's available to us right now. As I said, all of the options that NASA is looking at are going to cost significantly more than the president said he's prepared to pay. And at least two, the two options, A and B, which are based on Freedom Hardware, don't even give you permanent occupancy. 
Option C might give you permanent occupancy, but I think they're being very optimistic in their cost estimates on that. I think at this point, the only way that we can get a space station that will give us permanent occupancy and that will be affordable is if we join some of the hardware elements of the Freedom Program to the Russians' Mir space station and bring them in as full partners. This would have the additional benefit of symbolizing clearly that the Cold War is over, give us a way of encouraging democratization and stabilization in Russia, and give their aerospace engineers something to do in Russia rather than hopping on an airplane and building missiles for North Korea. Yeah, I agree that the Mir space station is something that's got to be utilized. I think John's right that the options that are under consideration and will be delivered to the president next week are going to be more expensive than the White House has said they're willing to pay. I think, however, that the Russian option gives Bill Clinton um, that opportunity to say, I'm going to do something bold like John Kennedy did back in 1961 when he said we wanted to go to the moon. I really feel that the option of using Mir along with as, met, as much of the space station elements as we can from freedom is the way to go. You mentioned the options being delivered to the president. Uh, how is that done? I mean, who, who, is there a presentation made? I mean, who makes the delivery of what all this entails? My understanding is that right now NASA will be making a public delivery of this information next week, possibly as early as Monday. By the end of the week, certainly all of that will have been reported to the White House specifically. And the president is going to look at his advisors, obviously, for input as to which option he should choose. We should mention there is an option D, which would be for the president to zero the space station and to not have one. That's really what we're trying to avoid. John Pike, is this, uh, is this something that the Federation or, or even the society for that matter has a say in? Is there any kind of mechanism uh, for people to get your views on this before it's presented? Well, hopefully some of the decision makers will be seeing this broadcast. Next call is from San Antonio. Good evening. Hey, good evening. Yes, I, I was just wondering about the, uh, the moon first and, and the Mirror Space Station, just kind of a follow-up on the Mirror Space Station. I was thinking more more in the lines of a uh, the moon first if they wanted to put us you know <clears throat> if they wanted to uh, put another sky lab up i was you know you know with the with the scale back like it is you know it's nothing more than a sky lab and i was just thinking if the moon first wasn't you know wasn't a way to go without the uh, and using the mirror uh, space station Thanks for the call. Uh, what does the caller mean by moon first? Well, it's basically a question that has been debated in the space community throughout this century of do you need a space station in low Earth orbit in order to continue deep space expeditions uh, or can you go directly to the moon the way we did with Apollo? In 1961, John Kennedy decided to go directly to the moon. More recently, it's been felt that we needed to have a space station in low Earth orbit to uh, give us the preparation for returning to the moon and going on to Mars. There are clearly some people, however, who fear that if we build a sta station that we would get stuck in Earth orbit and never get back to the moon or go to Mars. Washington, D.C., our next call. Good evening. Yeah, this is uh, Cram Snickpoo. I have a question for uh, Lori Garver. To, uh, I recognize that uh, voice as a, as a caller has been in before. Caller, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Secaucus, New Jersey. You're on the air. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to say, comment that uh, I've never missed uh, an American manned space launch in the past 30-some years, which may betray my age a little. But uh, I'd like to say that uh, I don't support building a space station uh, as much as I uh, believe in the, the country's manned space program. Uh, we have to have a manned space program. There's no point in ha having one without people involved in it. And I think we should make an effort to go back to the moon. Uh, it's, it's in orbit. It's there. It, it is a space station. And to me, it seems like uh, we want to build Antarctica to go to Antarctica as opposed to it already being there, if you catch what I'm trying to say. I think it's... Uh, uh, it's obviously important, and I'd like to make a point to Ms. Garver, because I am a member of the National Space Society, that it doesn't do much good to keep talking to people, let's say, 30 years or under, about Apollo, because they have no frame of reference in their life to it. It's, it's a chapter in a history book, and it's a bunch of stuff in a museum. It's, 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 it just, they don't connect to it, uh, to, as opposed to those of us who are getting on in a few years. So that's, that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Garber. Yeah, I think there is something to be said for going to the moon first. However, when we went the first time, we didn't stay. We didn't have what it took to make the commitment and stay there. And Werner von Braun, who's the founder of the National Space Society, actually supported having a space station developed on the way to the moon because it would give you an outpost that would help to keep you going to the moon and eventually onto Mars. 
However, since we do have the experience of Skylab and we do have the Mir space station program that, as we've mentioned, we could be cooperating on, we would be very supportive of a lunar base as a next option. I think if President Clinton decides he doesn't want a space station, and for some of the reasons that you outlined, and he instead chose to go to the moon, I think that would be a wonderful option that would be supported by space advocates. Alton, Illinois. Good evening. Yeah, this is my first time calling, and I'd like to express the fact, well, express my feeling that we must continue to explore space. We must either go to the moon, must get a space station in orbit, and I feel that a space station is a necessary first step at any cost, even if it's something like the Soviet Mir station. Caller, let me ask you why, why you think it's necessary to do that. We need some sort of a foothold in low Earth orbit to continue out onwards, mainly to curtail costs. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the call. A uh, comment from John Pike? Well, I think there are really two issues here. One of them is that when we return to the moon, what are we going to be able to do? It seems to me that um, one of the key things that you're going to learn in low Earth orbit is how to build reliable hardware that's going to be able to support people for an extended period of time. If something goes wrong with your life support system in the space station, you're only a few tens of minutes away from home, whereas the moon is several days away. The other consideration that I think has not been given adequate attention in this station debate is that there's a very real probability that before the end of the decade we're going to have another Challenger accident, that the shuttle might be permanently grounded, and it seems to me that that's going to pose very real questions about what the future of our space program is. If we don't have a commitment to permanent human presence in low Earth orbit, or if we don't have a commitment to return people to the moon or send them on to Mars, I think there's a very real possibility that that would mark the end of the space age. Yeah, I'd like to make the point that the space station was specifically um, tied with the space shuttle when it was sold to the president. It just so happened that President Nixon at the time said, oh, I don't want to do the whole thing, let's just do the shuttle. The shuttle was really all about going to and from the station and is somewhat looking for a purpose without a space station. Los Angeles, good evening. John, uh, my reception is not good here in Los Angeles, but are you wearing an earring, and if so, why? <laughs> No, I'm wearing an earplug to uh, hear your calls. <laughs> we, we all wear them here. It helps us hear you just a little bit better. Falls Church, Virginia, good evening. Hi, I've been listening to you. I think that we certainly ought to have a space station. We ought to keep moving beyond. And uh, you know, that's one of the few things that I don't worry about paying taxes for because it's money that's actually invested in the future of the human race. It's not poured down a rat hole here on the, here on the planet where we will never see any reward for it. I'd feel happier about a uh, about a tax for that than I would on my Social Security taxes, actually. Paul Church, we, we had talked briefly earlier about what's out there. Let me ask you, since you brought it, what do you see out there that's not here? Well, first of all, uh, there's, there's living room that isn't going to be knocked out by the same sort of events that could happen here, ranging from nuclear war to cosmic disaster. Uh, there's also uh, enormous resources, and you go out to the... Uh, major asteroids or even the minor asteroids and there are uh, mineral resources that are not even accessible here on earth in quantity there's the energy necessary to refine them uh, there's everything you need for civilization in space if you pump enough capital up there to get it started <laughs> okay thanks for the call i just want to add there's also a nice view of us here at home and john pike comment well, I think that the real problem is the capital. Space is very expensive. Uh, it's turned out to be much more expensive than the early dreamers and pioneers of the space program anticipated. And so it's a real challenge for us today to try to decide uh, whether space is worth it and why. My concern is that in focusing on near-term technological or commercial benefits, uh, that the Clinton administration may be trying to get the space program to do things that it's simply not capable of producing. About 15 minutes left in our uh, look at the status of the space station. Next call is from Houston. Good evening. Uh, yes. Um, my comment is about the trade-off between the Strategic Defense Initiative and a, a space station. It seems that the guests take comfort in the fact that the Cold War is over, even though we see nuclear proliferation throughout the world, uh, new threats in North Korea, and uh, we see more threats coming from possibly the Middle East. And um, at the same time, we're seeing advancements in areas that are key to strategic defense uh, technology, such as the synthetic
Paddock Diamond from General Electric. Um, my question is this. Why are the guests so quick to cut spending in the area of strategic defense initiative and, and put money into to the space station? Oh. Thanks. Thanks for the call. Let's uh, start with Lori Garber. Yeah, first, I guess our point mainly is that economic conversion is an issue that everyone's talked about. We are cutting back on our military. That is a fact. We have trained personnel in the areas of technology development that can easily go into working on the civil space program. We would not be in favor of cutting those jobs if they weren't already being cut. And I think right now the space program serves as a very nice rationale for the end of, um, as a symbol rather, of the end of the Cold War. We started this program to beat the Russians. I mean, that's why we were going to the moon. And I think now to go with the Russians really allows us to have a very nice continuation of a program that was started because of the Cold War. Well, the biggest missile threat to, Ru to America today is from Russia. It's a threat in the sense that Russian aerospace engineers not being able to find anything to do at home are going to hop on airplanes and move to North Korea. Last fall, 60 of them were detained at the Moscow airport just before their airplane for Korea took off. The danger from Russia is that the reform process over there is going to be set back. Perhaps there could be loose nukes or perhaps there could be a change to a more hostile government. It seems to me that all of these dangers, which are the main dangers facing us in missiles, can be averted if we join with the Russians and build a space station which is going to give them hope for the future and give them something to do besides threatening us. I think it would be far better to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in that to deal with the problem before it starts than to invest the four billion dollars a year that's going to be an imperfect response to the problem after it's too late. Next call is from Windsor, California. Good evening. Hi, my name is Peter Gisela, and in my hands is the only copy of a NASA project that built an advanced technology house. This was through the Ames Research at Moffett Field. It was started in January 1980, and it was canceled in June 1, 1981. And it was a joint venture between NASA, the California Architectural Association, and Pacific Gas and Electric to build an advanced technology modular house and museum to understand what materials from the space age could be applied to housing. Unfortunately, when President Reagan came in, he told NASA to cut their budget, and NASA didn't like this project, so they killed it. And I find it very depressing that, you know, they talk about using space technology to enhance our daily lives, and I was extremely excited about this project, but reluctant to see it die. And they didn't even fund any money to print up their final report on this project, and the gentleman for NASA that was working on it retired and gave me the only copy. <laughs> Thanks for the call. Yeah, I would like to mention that the President's package does outline technology investment as part of what he'd like to see NASA funding. And that technology package hinges on NASA coming in under budget for the space station. There's one amount of money, and if the space station fills it all up, there won't be a technology package. One of the reasons to redesign the space station, I believe, on the part of the administration was so that NASA could focus on some of these other very exciting developments that could come about because of the space program. But I think the bottom line is that the main benefit from the space program has been political and cultural. We certainly ought to be seeing what uh, sort of applications we can get out of space technology. But I think that uh, as with cathedrals, the main benefit of the space program is uh, spiritual and psychological rather than material. Santa Monica, California. Good evening. Yes, I noticed that John Pike said that there are relatively few tangible benefits uh, for the space station, and I wanted to know if Lori Garver agreed with that, and in particular what some of those tangible benefits may be. Thank you. Yes, certainly there are tangible benefits to the space program. We um, have developed a number of things through the space program that, that have been extremely important, such as the computer technology and miniaturization, um, development of new materials, and so forth. But I agree with John Pike that probably it's difficult to invest the money specifically because of those spin-off technologies that come out of the space program. We really are doing this because of humanity's interest in exploring and I think that we cannot justify the funds based on things we don't know will come out of the investment. There will be returns on our investment but since we can't yet say what those will be I think it's worth spending the small percentage of the US budget that we do um, to find out not only what those benefits will be specifically, but because 
we want to explore and expand the knowledge of humanity. Benton, Kentucky, good evening. Yes, I have a question for uh, Lori Garber. Uh, isn't uh, the bad science on the space station argument advanced by Mr. Pike a little bogus? Isn't it, it really a uh, question of new science or future science, science that our children might uh, conduct uh, versus uh, current grant holders who are just protecting their turf? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like the callers are doing my work for me here. There's certainly a lot of um, good science that happens on the space station. The scientists you get that are against the space station are those scientists who don't have something they want to do on the space station. There's such a thing as scientists for the human space program and they support the space station. I believe that you have um, a lot of good science going on. Again, it's hard to say what you're going to get out of the returns when you invest in the space program because some of them are long term and because we haven't had a laboratory in space. When you have the space shuttle you've got something like seven to ten days that you can spend doing your experiments. With the space station program for the first time we're going to have a laboratory so with that laboratory is going to definitely be come with good science. John Pike? We spent $120 billion on the Apollo program, and about all we got out of it was Tang and Velcro. If you're simply looking for material benefits, I personally think Apollo was worth it, but not in a material sense. One study, in fact, the only study that NASA's done trying to figure out what the true benefits of its technological spinoffs are, was completed several years ago and concluded that NASA was only sh uh, producing about 10 cents of spin-off benefits for every dollar that it was investing in space technology. So if you're looking for material benefits, I think that space is probably one of the last places that you ought to be investing your money. Sure, you're going to get something, but if that's the only reason that you're investing in it, that's the last place you ought to go. Dallas, good evening. Ooh, lost <laughs> Dallas. And caller, where are you calling from? Uh, Fort Myers. You're on the air. All right, I was going to uh, say, since space is a long-term investment, uh, why don't we think about going to the moon first and that way you can pay for it over a long period of time and use the moon as a starting post because going around just in orbit you're spending eight million dollars just to go in orbit and you got to go do the the moon thing anyways later on 20 years down the road or or so so uh, thanks Lord. we kind of addressed earlier the uh, the moon first question so we'll uh, go on to chicago good evening yes i'd just like to say that i'm really very, uh, very much for the space program, very much for the space program. And I think that um, Lori, I believe, excuse me, her idea about the spinoff are just sort of irrelevant or we shouldn't do it because of the spinoff. I mean, I'm sitting here with my remote control and I got my microwave oven and, and I think that that, the, that, the Amer that America in, in, as a whole really supports the space program and these benefits the spin-offs, my brother's computer that he has, which can rearrange a person's face and everything on the, on the screen. I mean, it's fantastic. But just one more comment. I, I'm for space exploration 100% because of the spin-offs and because of its, that it's exciting, but I am not for nuclear proliferation, and I believe that all of the space technology should be for humanity's growth, not humanity's demise. Thank you for the call. John Pike. Absolutely. I can't uh, agree with you more. I hope the president's watching so he knows <laughs> that the public really supports this program and he ought to choose one of those options. Scranton, Pennsylvania. Good evening. Yes, I could uh, never understand why there wouldn't be a coalition between the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and the Defense Department. It seems to me that it's a logical extension uh, of our national defense to be positioned in a uh, space station at which uh, we can observe our friends and enemies and uh, provide some of the justification uh, for the uh, science which will occur in, in the space station itself. Uh, certainly the cost in the long run, I believe, is, is really uh, uh, beneficial to the to the country, uh, being a product of the early 60s and, and had, having worked in the uh, space industry in my early career, uh, I, I take exception that 10% uh, of the space dollars uh, resulted in uh, Velcro and, 
and one other uh, technological benefit. Uh, that, thanks, Pennsylvania. We're just about short on time, so we'll let John Pike respond. Well, the National Reconnaissance Office, the agency that runs our spy satellites, is spending over $7 billion a year right now on robotic spy satellites. Study after study over the last 25 years has demonstrated that robotic spies in space are more cost effective than uh, a, st a piloted station would be. But again, it seems to me that uh, after the Cold War, there's a substantial opportunity for reducing the budget of the National Reconnaissance Office, and maybe we'd be better off from a foreign policy perspective to support reform in Russia to take some of that National Reconnaissance Office money and put it into the space station. Salt Lake City, good evening. Oh, hi. Well, I'm really surprised to get on, but uh, I, uh, I've been had an interest in the space program that's wondering now that we have no more problem and conflict between us and the Soviet Union, why don't we make this a world project? I'm thanks not... Thanks very much for the call, Lori Garber, in this uh, USA Today article. It talks about the U.S. involving some of our allies. How are they involved? We have a partnership with the Europeans, the Japanese, and the Canadians on space station freedom. The redesign, one of the criteria for the redesign was that it would keep the international partners to the extent that it could involved in the program. As we've already mentioned, we will also hopefully be bringing in the Russians. They are advisors on the redesign program since they have so much experience on the Mir space station. Again, I just think it's an, a fantastic way to proceed to involve not only our existing international partners, but the Commonwealth of Independent States. Lake Isabella, California. Good evening. Well, yes, good afternoon, actually, out mm -hmm. here in California. Uh, the station redesign is calling for maybe four crew members, and I'm sure that there's dozens, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, regular people that eventually want to go and live and work and you know, possibly play in space. When are we actually going to get to that point where we're going to be opening up the space frontier to more than just the regular astronauts? And secondly, uh, we just got C-SPAN out here. I saw the addresses for the Federation of American scientists and the National Space Society, but I didn't see any phone numbers. Are there phone numbers that we can call for these uh, two organizations? Sure, and I'll tell you also, at the end of the program, uh, the addresses will be up again at the end of the uh, credit rolls, but uh, uh, Lori Garber, a phone sure. number? Sure, first I'll give you an 800 number, 1-800-543-1280 for information on the National Space Society and how you can join. And in response to the question, I think you're right. I mean, you could be a member. The members of the National Space Society want to go into space. Uh, the four people that will go on space station, that's a nice thing. Our president is Charlie Walker. He's been in space three times. But he really only serves as an emissary for the rest of us. I think that the reduction of the cost to orbit is probably the only way to go as far as people like you and I going into space. That will eventually happen, and hopefully sooner rather than later. And John Pike, a phone number. 202-675-1025. Uh, uh, in terms of getting people into space, I think that the real challenge facing the Clinton administration today is whether it decides to use the space program and the space station as a way of joining with the reform process in Russia to continue and extend human presence in space. I think absence of commitment to that, uh, that NASA is basically a time bomb waiting for the next shuttle to blow up. And in that eventuality, I think there's a clear and present danger that the space age will be over for perhaps uh, decades, if not centuries, to come. So these are very significant decisions that are going to be remembered for a very long time. And I hope that uh, the president makes the right one. Last call with just about a minute left is from uh, Manaka, Pennsylvania. Good evening. Good evening. I'd like to know if option D was picked and the space station was canceled, what would our other international partners do? Go with Russia with MIRS too, or would we be the lone lone player out by ourselves? Thank you. Lori Garber? I think that if the president chooses not to submit a budget for the space station program, there will be a fight in the, on the Hill to try and get a space station program back in the budget. If that was unsuccessful, yes, our partners could very likely work with Russia on the Mir-2, their follow-on to their existing space station program. But that will be difficult because, of course, our international agreements took many years to hammer out. And I think certainly we want to do everything we can to keep the partners together and to be a leader for the space station program. We're out of time. Lori Garber is executive director of the National Space Society. And John Pike is director of the Space Policy Project at the Federation of American Scientists. And as I mentioned, at the end, both addresses will be up. Thank you both for being with us. And we thank you, as always, for your calls and your comments. Have a good evening.
If you have comments, you may address them to the National Space Society, 922 Pennsylvania Avenue Southeast in Washington, D.C., and the zip code is 20003. To contact the Federation of American Scientists, write to 307 Massachusetts Avenue Northeast in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20002. Be sure to be with us Sunday, June 6th at 7 p.m. for an interview with Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. Coming next here on C-SPAN, a look at our overnight schedule.